This is Elizabeth Melton. I am the Public Engagement Director at the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I am interviewing Dr. Jorge Rodriguez about the Loose Retreat uh, for the COVID-19 emergency grants that took place at the Fetzer Institute in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We are joining today uh, virtually using Riverside.fm. Um, it is July 11th, 2023. So, Jorge, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. So, I'm Dr. Jorge Juan Rodriguez V. Um, I wear many hats. Um, my full time work is I'm the associate director for the Hispanic Summer Program. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that creates year round educational spaces for Latinx graduate students of religion and theology. I'm also a visiting assistant professor at Union Theological Seminary. But what brings me to this space is that through some of my consulting work that I've done with the Center for Religion in the Cities, I've gotten connected with IDCL um, and had the opportunity and privilege to facilitate the conversation of the loose COVID 19 emergency grantees. Uh, at the Fetzer Institute earlier this year. Thank you so much. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about just your experience um, as facilitator at the retreat. Um, what was that experience like for you? Sure. So I think the work of being a facilitator starts well before the time together in the room. And so in the months leading up, I had the privilege of working with you, Elizabeth, and with Tiffany, Harold Morales, um, trying to think well, Santana from CRC, as well as um, Teresa Smallwood, and a few others to think through what we wanted this retreat to be. And I think what we came up with was really the the revolving around a few things. Whenever I do facilitation work, part of what I ask people that I'm facilitating with is at the end of the retreat, what is the affect, what is the knowledge, and what is the action that you want people to walk away with? And I think that in the months preparing for this retreat, what we really came up with was that the affect was giving people space to kind of breathe, to rest, to reflect and have kind of a reflective tone throughout uh, the retreat, but also to feel proud and empowered uh, about the work that they did so that the kind of knowledge that they could walk away with is more knowledge about who else is in the room and what other opportunities emerge from them so that the action they could walk away with is thinking through what other type of community-based work they could do. So part of that looked formal, such as giving them the opportunity to apply to microgrants um, afterwards. But part of that looked informal also. The relationships that were built with one another, the relationships that were built with foundations, such as Luce and Fetzer, but I also imagine that has dividends for other relationships beyond those uh, two endowments. So having that pre-work before the facilitation allowed us then to enter the facilitation space um, with kind of an understanding of, for me, the most important thing is the tone. I, I often think about facilitation work as, um, you know, one part preparation, one part administration, and kind of seven parts has to do with um has to do with psychology and sociology. There is someone uh, doing work next door. Can you hear that? Or is that okay? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Um, but with regards to that kind of sociology and, and psychology is really kind of feeling the affect in the space. So we prepared the facilitation around a few central movements. The first movement was where were you? In other words, what was your project um, that you started off with? And what was the uh, the goal and aim of that project? Where are you? Um, in other words, what has occurred in that project since? Um, and where is it right now in its current life? And where are you going? And who are you going with? That was kind of the third movement, which is essentially this idea of like, even, first of all, some projects should have ended if they have not ended, and really teasing out what it means for 
um, us to have a different relationship with conclusions instead of this idea of a perpetual progress, really leaning into the idea that, no, some things should come to a good end. And that's a beautiful thing. That's an opportunity. But then the other side of it is like some things shouldn't come to an end. Some things should be able to move on and grow and expand. And the question becomes, how do we find resources that aren't just economic resources, but also spiritual resources that give us the opportunity not to burn out, but actually be able to sustain this work Um, as well as kind of partner resources of other people we can walk alongside with as we're doing this work. And so that last part of these of this three part movement was really grounded in this idea of like, should your project have ended? And if not, where should it go now? And who do you need to go alongside you um, in that work? Thank you for that, Jorge. I'd I'd love to hear a bit more um, about some of the specific themes and conversations that came up, because it seemed like there were a lot of really important and powerful conversations happening among the retreat attendees. What are some of the the conversations or the themes that really stand out to you from the retreat? Yeah. I I will say that there are three because I always default to three, but there might be five, there might be two. So we'll see where it goes. Um, But in no particular order, I think one of the resounding themes was really grief. Um, A lot of the participants talked about what it meant to be doing this work at the height of a public health crisis that they were not, no one was expecting when our lives were upended. And we were trying to figure out how to respond in a way that actually made sense, um, made sense in terms of our own relationships to communities, but also made sense in terms of what would actually be impactful and sustainable beyond the scope of this work. But part of the grief was also, part of the grief in that was like what was lost, Um, including but not limited to people. Um, There was a specific day that I remember where, um, and I knew we, I knew this might come up. One of the things that I've had the privilege of doing is having done facilitations enough, you kind of get a sense about at what point you might need to throw out your plan. And I, I kind of got a sense that around day two, when we were really, or around session two, when we were really talking about where we are in this work, um, some folks who perhaps hadn't had the opportunity to truly reflect on what had transpired since they started this work might have the opportunity to do so, and it might lead to a shift in the energy. And that did happen when one of the participants reflected on the fact that one of the people that was really close to them in this work had passed away, um, ironically, not because of COVID, but because of um, other health complications that when they really analyzed what the connections were, the connections were connected to stress, to the ways that communities, particularly communities of color, particularly black communities, um, needing to be so many things for their people are often overburdened in a way that has manifest tolls on their body. And so we really sat with the grief of that reality of what was lost socially, what was lost communally during this time of the pandemic, but also who was lost, the you know millions of people who died because of COVID, but also the people who didn't die because of COVID, but because of the ongoing implications of that, including the stress of caring for people in this time. And so the theme of grief was so central and really asking, I think, one of the questions of one of our uh, partners was, what does love have to do with it? And really sitting with, what does it mean for grief to be an expression of love? In other words, we cannot grieve that which we did not originally love. So that was one of the themes that we covered. Another theme we covered was the complexity of privilege for academics, um, being in relationship to community partners. Um, A kind of uh, elephant in the room was the fact that even though many of these academics, uh, mostly academics, not all, but mostly academics, people connected to universities um, or to institutions of higher learning in some way, shape or form, had the 
privileged to disperse, receive and disperse these grants. And yet the people who received these grants were not in the room. And so part of what we wrestled with was what does it mean to have community-based research, community-based work, but the privileges and hierarchies of these institutions, meaning that it is those who are connected to institutions of higher learning who are often in the room, often the ones who have the power to disperse or redistribute the grants. Um, and that wasn't really something that was resolved per se, but it did lead to bigger conversations about philanthropy writ large, which I think is a third theme. Um, questions about who, how, questions about processes, right? In other words, who, how do, the, who creates the processes by which grants are given and distributed, but also who reviews them, what paperwork is needed, what um, uh, relationships are needed, et cetera. And that was particularly clear because community partners were, or, or these academics rather who received the grants from Luce were reflecting on the fact that they had to completely reshape or throw out the processes that they were used to for granting and reporting when engaging community partners who themselves had perhaps never written a grant or who perhaps had never don't necessarily understand or find useful the type of reporting that's often needed in, by philanthropic organizations. And so I would say that those two things are intimately connected, both the power dynamics of it being academics or in individuals connected to institutions, being the ones in the room reflecting, having conversations, but also the second piece is them being the ones having conversations and with community partners about the processes of philanthropy, both in terms of applying to funding and in terms of receiving and then reporting on funding and the ways this is often um, limiting to community partners on multiple levels, one of which is language. We talked a lot about you know, reporting mechanisms being in English. And then what happens if your community-based partner doesn't speak English? We talked a lot about um, you know, just reading and writing skills. Academic can, academics can whip up, you know, a 10-page report in an afternoon in part because that's what we're trained to do. We literally have uh, a professional mandate to do this type of work, but that's not the mandate that some of the community partners have. And in fact, we academics would not be able to do the work that they do. And so the question becomes, what does a partnership look like um, in terms of making sure that this fund, these funding sources are accessible to a wider community while also being attentive to these power dynamics and not just being attentive to them, but actually asking how do philanthropic organizations change and shift in order to make this work and this funding opportunity more accessible to a wider public. Um, I would say those are kind of the three themes that that emerge. Again, grief, the question, that's one. Two is the question of the power dynamics of academics um, or people connected to you know, learning organizations receiving the money and community partners not being there. And then third, the real bigger questions of philanthropic organizations, how they fund and how they report and how those mechanisms are, um, you know, limiting at best and exclusionary at worst. I think that's a really great kind of encapsulation of a lot of the key ideas that, that came out of it. And I think that your ability to articulate that, right? That those relationships between grief, kind of academic privilege and the systems of dispersing monies really, um, you know, I think that that's, it's a really important snapshot to kind of think about all the different complexities of, of these, of this specific group of projects, but then also just kind of um, this type of work in general. Um, I'm wondering if kind of thinking about the, the feelings and the affects in the room um, of the retreat, kind of how, how did that affect you as a facilitator? And also kind of what, what did it leave you thinking about kind of moving forward? Yeah. You know, one thing that came up in the afternoon conversations and in the um, really on that closing day was 
how surprised people were about how deep they could get so quickly. And so part of what we were talking about or part of what I was sharing was in terms of my own um, philosophy of facilitation. I don't know if that's a thing, but I'm going to make it a thing for the purposes of this conversation. Um, is that, you know, I always try at every moment, especially at the beginning, to kind of displace the titles, displace the the credentials. And so one thing that I did in a pre-meeting we had over Zoom with all of the all of the um, attendees was that I asked them to do uh, seven word introductions where everyone had to in the Zoom call um, in small groups kind of come up with an introduction of themselves in seven words and they couldn't talk about like their academic work. It had to be like about who they are as people, why they care about the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and after about 20 minutes of people in small groups, everyone came back just laughing um, and sharing their seven word introductions. And that was kind of the, the tone, even over a Zoom call before we got there in person, that we set for, the, for our time together. And then when we got into our time together, part of that tone continued with the first um, questions we had for each other being about communities not about us as individuals, not about us as academics, not about our writing, et cetera. And I say that because for me, I don't think that we can get to those affects that we want to facilitate into unless we displace and counteract the affects we're socialized into. And what I mean by that, to not be too heady and academic, is I do think that for this particular audience that was primarily connected to learning institutions, and by that I mean universities, museums, and similar types of institutions, I do think that we are socialized into an affect of competition and an affect of um, hierarchy, where the first things that we're invited to do are to tell our credentials and tell our connections to institutions, right? So this is a profession that's very tied to signaling connections to institutions and sites of power. And what that does is that it inherently, when we do that and when we start facilitations like that, what it inherently does is that it places us in an affect where in our bodies, we feel on guard that we need to compete and outperform one another. That, to me, inherently undermines the ability to create community, which I think is the predeterminate factor for risk, which is the predeterminate factor for innovation. So part of where I wanted to get people by the end of it, by the end of our three days together, is really to discussing why does this matter to me and people beyond me? And what can I do to actually continue that conversation going? And in that to make that work possible, we had to make a space, an environment where people felt that they were part of, felt that they were part of something bigger, even just in the room. And I share this because that cultivating that affect in the room was very intentional. And I think the lingering thing I felt was not surprise that people were thrown off by that because I think I've been in the academy enough to know that doing things in this way is a different way of approaching um, the dominant ways we're socialized into. Again, what I was saying about like the dominant affect. Um, but I do feel perpetually saddened that that is that we are so accustomed to that flavor of alienation in our learning institutions that it feels so new and foreign that it becomes a novelty when we instead center community and instead center questions of care and questions of sustainability um, in the ways that we facilitate our conversations. And so I think the question that continues for me is that that type of learning, that type of community-based affect is something that comes from my own relationship to communities. And so this whole grounded knowledge, this whole um, COVID-19 grant was really is really asking 
how do we help scholars, how do we help academics broadly connect more closely to communities on the ground? And I think for me, part of that starts with first asking, what are the epistemologies and what are the praxises, praxis, and what are the performances of communities on the ground that invite us into a disruption of dominant academic forms of engagement? And so in as much as that, these questions of how are philanthropic institutions limiting and isolating and exclusionary, one way we can start asking that is what practices do communities have that challenge the philanthropic institutions, right? When we ask these questions of academics of like, how are academics trying to build new ways of creating connections with communities? I think we need to sit and wrestle with why are so many community-based organizations, especially activist organizations, suspicious of academics? Why do they have questions about when academics enter the room um, because of histories and histories of academics entering spaces, extracting knowledge, profiting, and not giving back, right? And part of that, another way of reading that suspicion is also that these community-based organizations have care. They care for their people. They care for their community. They care for the people in the room and they care for the knowledge that they produce. And so the question for me again is, how do we in our facilitation also center practices of care that inherently destabilize the ways we are dominantly socialized in academic spaces? And also about the lingering thing, how do we also hold space to grieve the fact that we have not been socialized to care? That's something I'm still wrestling with. I think I wrestle with that in general, but I'm also honored that, you know, I could come alongside this community and invite a different way of engaging these questions. And I think it was effective. Like I do, I do think that people walked away with, um, with their, their heads held high, not in a way that was over aggrandizing, but that was sober about the work that still needs to be done, but also, hopeful of the work that can be done. Yeah, thank you for for that kind of summation of, of those those feelings and kind of that um, that that leaving sense of where we left things um, at the retreat. I, I do I think that it's really it's it's both that kind of tragic beauty of the, the grief is kind of where we are still sitting and, and that space of needing to, to learn to care and, um, and to care for one another. Um, so much can be said about academia and it's, it's need for people to care for one another. Mm-hmm. But um, is there, I, before we kind of wrap up, I wanted to, to give you space. If there's anything else that, that you feel like, was important to lift up about the retreat in your time there. I think it was such a unique space. Um, and I mean that both like literally and metaphorically. Um, literally is that the Fetzer Institute is just a beautiful place. Um, I think having the opportunity to be in a place that was surrounded by nature, that had state-of-the-art facilities that was comfortable that was um we were fed so well um i don't think that can be understated in terms of when we're so busy and so pushing and so struggling having the opportunity to be in a physical space that allows rest makes reflection all the more possible And the tension, again, that we discussed and I brought up earlier today is like, you know, how do we also give community partners the opportunity to be in those spaces? Um, Not just the not just the academics that should also be in those spaces. It's not an either or it's a both and. Um, But I think it was also a unique space uh, metaphorically in the sense that rarely do we have a unique space in two senses, metaphorically. One is that rarely do we have an opportunity 
after we receive a grant or after we undergo a project to actually explore the implications of that project in a sustained way. And I think that any good teacher knows that a central aspect of teaching is reflection, reflecting on what went well, what didn't go well, what can be changed, what can be improved. We often don't have the opportunity to apply those same principles to grant opportunities that we receive. Um, And while the reporting does offer some of that, it's different to be in a community space where you have other people in different contexts that are unified by a similar granting moment um, who can bounce ideas off one another and reflect with one another in a more sustained and deep way. I think the uniqueness of that cannot be understated and should be replicated. The other uniqueness was the opportunity to have funding partners and grantees in such close proximity and such shared relationship uh, to one another. You know, there was one day where we were talking, the, the conversation naturally went into the implications of um, of this work for philanthropists in terms of reporting. And it was not lost on me that some of the sharp critiques um, that were being raised in the room by grantees were being raised in a room with their funder right there with their program officer, with other potential program officers right there, with people who actually have influence on whatever the multi-million dollar portfolio they manage are, is, but also influence in the networks of philanthropic organizations that they're connected to. Um, And so to have that relationship there in a way that I don't think we can undermine that power dynamics were still at play, There was still a knowledge that, okay, my funder is here, therefore, how do I want to engage this? But some of those power dynamics were diffused in a way that was helpful by the fact that those funders were not just there as observers, but were actually there as participants. You know, someone like Jonathan Van Antwerpen at at Luce was in the conversations, taking notes on whiteboards, you know, keeping time. Um, some other folks from Fetz or Muhammad and Muhammad were also connected to the conversations. Sarah Wade, who even though she is not a, a program officer, she is still connected to the broader Fetzer Institute, was there also actively participating in conversation, leading meditations, whatever the case may be. And so some of those power dynamics could be stretched in a way um, or thinned in a way, I suppose, that they still existed, but critiques could still be leveled in a way that were listened to and one knew would have lasting implications. And so I think that the one, like one of the major takeaways as we're thinking about what this, how this retreat provides a lesson, both for other retreats by IDCL and Luce, but also as a model for other grantees um, at other philanthropic organizations is, again, the uniqueness of the space, both the physical space in terms of how beautiful it was, and the metaphorical space, both in the sense of um, having an opportunity to reflect with people of like minds and like experiences years after, and the uniqueness of the space metaphorically in the sense of having both the grantor and the grantee in the same room speaking about what happened, but also about how this yields lessons for how things can change. I think that uniqueness cannot be lost. Thank you so much. I I love your ability to to articulate and bring ideas together and to to encapsulate um, your observations. So thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you taking time to speak with me about your experiences as facilitator Um, I'll stop the recording now. Sounds good. Thank you.